Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us as we observe Heart Month. I'm Dr. Eric Reshba, uh, Director of the Heart Rhythm Center at Stony Brook Heart Institute. Our Heart Rhythm Center includes a team of board certified electrophysiologists uh, who are cardiologists who specialize in the electrical activity of the heart. And I'm pleased to be here with Dr. Abram Al Masri, Dr. Roger Fan, and Dr. Abhijit Singh. Uh, I see you guys every day, but uh, I kind of forgot what you look like uh, mm -hmm. since we've been wearing masks for the last two years. So this is great. I think everyone can appreciate what a handsome team of electrophysiologists <laughs> we have at the Heart Rhythm Center. So, so today uh, we are here to answer your questions on the latest developments in the prevention, detection, and treatment of atrial fibrillation, or AFib for short, and other types of heart rhythm disorders. Uh, thank you to those who submitted questions before today's webinar. There's a lot of interest and a lot of great questions, and we'll try to address as many of them as we can. Uh, if you do have a question during the discussion, you can send it in, and again, we'll try to address it. Uh, so just to start, uh, the focus of this discussion is on uh, atrial fibrillation or AFib. So uh, what are we talking about? Uh, Abram, can you describe what AFib is? And uh, sure. Thanks very much, Eric. Um, so atrial fibrillation is a, is a disruption of the normal rhythm that everyone experiences, which we call normal sinus rhythm. Typically, there is one uh, impulse that <clears throat> starts off in the pacemaker of the heart that we call the sinus node that then activates electrically the two top chambers of the heart, which we call the atrium. In atrial fibrillation, this activation is disrupted by electrical impulses that are occurring from areas within the heart, within those atria that are rapidly firing, and they cause an irregularity of the electrical impulses in the atria and this results in an irregularity of the mechanical squeezing of the two top chambers of the heart, and also in turn results in an irregularity of the actual heart rhythm that we feel as a pulse. And so with atrial fibrillation, typically you will experience a rapid heartbeat that is also irregular. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and you know, what are some of the causes of atrial fibrillation and risk factors for its occurrence, uh, Dr. Singh? Yeah, so uh, thank you, um, Eric. Uh, so atrial fibrillation uh, is probably one of the most common arrhythmias we see. Uh, some of the risk factors that have been described for developing atrial fibrillation, I guess the most important one and the most strong one is the heart aging or people aging. Um, as it's a very age-related arrhythmia. Only about 1% of people less than 65 years have atrial fibrillation, and it reaches up to 20% by the time they turn 80 years old. Um, it's also uh, more in Caucasians as compared to other races. Uh, some of the risk factors associated are long-standing high blood pressure, especially if it's uncontrolled. Uh, it increases the pressure in the heart, enlarges the left upper chamber, and that causes atrial fibrillation. Um, there's a, a, a correlation with obesity, just weight, a body mass index, which is more than 27, increases your chances of developing atrial fibrillation. Uh, untreated sleep apnea, that's one of the big uh, things that we see. Uh, and any patient who comes to me with atrial fibrillation, we definitely tell them to get a sleep study done uh, to make sure they don't have underlying sleep apnea. Uh, then other risk factors could be valvular disease, uh, congestive heart failure, thyroid disorders, so these are some of all um, diseases or risk factors that are associated with developing atrial fibrillation. All right, great. And uh, Dr. Fan, how do uh, uh, people know that they're in AFib? Like what symptoms should they look for? And is it possible that they may not know about, about having atrial fibrillation? Yeah, that's a really great question because um, AFib, the way people experience it, every single patient is different how they experience experience AFib. Uh, it ranges from some patients don't even know that they're, they're in it. So they can be in AFib all the time and they really don't know. Uh, and it ranges to some people who feel every little extra beat that they get in the heart uh, and they can be incredibly symptomatic. So the symptoms people typically get are palpitations or what we call uh, fluttering in the chest or skip beats in the chest. Uh, it can range from fatigue, shortness of breath, um, uh, chest discomfort, dizziness. So there's a lot of varied symptoms and presentations for AFib. 
And it could be subtle as well, right? I mean, some people are just fatigued and, you know. Sure. Uh, some of the time, the baseline cardiac function also uh, plays a role in how symptomatic patients are. If a uh, patient's heart muscles are uh, somewhat compromised, they may experience symptoms of atrial fibrillation uh, more dramatically than others. True. I mean, there are patients who like pass out or come close to passing out and they come in and they're in this irregular heart rhythm, AFib. So yeah, I mean, it's a varied, a uh, lot of uh, manifestations of AFib. All right. So as you guys kind of touched on, AFib has a lot of different implications. So uh, what are the things to think about in terms of, you know, risks that atrial fibrillation poses? Uh, Abra, maybe you can address some of that. Uh, sure. Um, so one of the biggest and most obvious risks uh, is the risk of stroke. Um, the reason is that the, um, the rhythm itself, atrial fibrillation, uh, causes a disruption of the normal mechanical squeezing of the top chamber of the heart, the atrium. And so the blood leaving the atrium sometimes does not leave completely. And the atria has areas within it where blood can collect. We call those, uh, you know, one particular area is called the left atrial appendage. Uh, that's a small uh, area within the left atrium where blood can collect. And when it does, it can clot, and those clots can then break off and cause stroke. And so stroke is one of the biggest consequences and one of the most debilitating complications of atrial fibrillation. And so we take a great deal of effort and care to try and avoid that. And really the best way to do that is with a blood thinner when it's appropriate based on the patient's risk factors. So patients uh, basically are evaluated based on a scoring system uh, in terms of how high their risk is of developing atrial fibrillation. Things like their age, uh, whether they have congestive heart failure or not, high blood pressure, diabetes, prior strokes, all of those things play a role into whether a patient should be placed on a blood thinner or not. So obviously each patient is gonna be different and unique. The second thing is that atrial fibrillation causes a rapid heartbeat in most patients, but not in all. Sometimes if that rapid heartbeat is unnoticed for a prolonged period of time, it can result in a deterioration of the overall function of the patient's heart muscle. And I kind of think of it as a heart muscle that gets tired over time. And patients can actually present with symptoms of heart failure at that point. And it's important to recognize that there could be other causes for that, or it could simply be the atrial fibrillation. And that's where a workup is important to try and tease those things out. Great. Well, while we're on the topic of symptoms, uh, we're getting comments already. So this is great. Um, so uh, Patty wants to know uh, if you have short episodes of AFib, when it feels like your heart's trying to get back into a normal rhythm, it feels like it stops and starts back up and you get a tingling sensation through your whole body. Uh, what might that represent, Dr. Sim? Yeah, so uh, thank you for your question. Um, so like we said, everyone has different symptoms. And if you feel like your heart is fluttering and uh, it has been, and if you're wearing a monitor or some sort of a device, which actually recognizes that your symptoms are correlating with atrial fibrillation, the irregularity, what happens is if you have short episodes, your heart goes from AFib to normal rhythm. And in some people, when it does that, there's a little bit of a pause, which may be a few seconds. And that may be that you're feeling that your heart stops for a few seconds and then goes back into normal rhythm. So, uh, if, so a lot of arrhythmias can cause these symptoms, but if it has been diagnosed with like an EKG that, that your symptoms are correlating with short episodes of atrial fibrillation, then definitely you need to see uh, an electrophysiologist for more uh, recommendations. Okay. Yeah. So that could definitely be, you know, what we call a conversion pause. It takes a little while for the normal heart rhythm to wake up after being in rapid atrial fibrillation. So that can cause dizziness if there's a pause in the heart rhythm. You kind of touched on something else in terms of figuring out what's going on. So someone has palpitations, you know, uh, how do we know whether it's AFib or it can be a number of the different arrhythmias or no arrhythmia at all, you know, that we uh, frequently deal with. So, uh, uh, can you talk a little bit about the types of monitoring choices that are available to help us really make the diagnosis and know if people have AFib or something else or whether we can just reassure them? Yeah, uh, that's, I think, a great question because before we come to treatment, we want to know a diagnosis. 
and uh, uh, technology has advanced a lot. I mean, 20 years ago, I think we used to have these big devices that people used to wear around their necks and, um, and they were cumbersome. They could only record for 24 to 48 hours, but now technology has advanced. Uh, we have these uh, comfortable patches that you put on the chest and you can wear a patch for up to 14 days, um, a single patch, and it records each and every heartbeat of yours. So when you have a symptom, you can record a symptom activator and it, and it records the heart rhythm at that point. So later when we analyze it, we can see if your symptoms actually correlated with an arrhythmia, because sometimes you have arrhythmias and you don't feel them. And sometimes you feel something and it's not an arrhythmia. So it helps with correlation between the symptoms and an arrhythmia. So that's called an extended holter. We also have live monitoring of your heart rhythm. It's called a mobile cardiac telemetry uh, in which someone's actually monitoring your heart at all times when you're wearing the patch. Those patches, uh, the battery life is five days and then you recharge it for a couple of hours, wear it on again. Uh, so you can do that for 30 days at a time. We also have these small implantable loop recorders which we can actually implant under the skin with a small incision. It's an outpatient procedure, it takes five minutes to do. And the battery life on that thing is about four and a half years. So if you are someone who has these uh, episodes of palpitations once in six months, and we know we're not gonna catch it on a 30 day monitor external, uh, we can consider putting those small chip in the chest under the skin, and it can record uh, those arrhythmias. And uh, the most convenient thing, uh, the most recent thing that I've seen now is these wearables, these smart watches, uh, which can actually, uh, you can record an EKG when you're having symptoms and it uh, transmits this to your phone and you can email it to us so that we can see what the arrhythmia is and if you're having any symptoms at that time. So uh, the technology has changed. I mean, uh, we've come a long way in the last few years. Yeah, the smart watch uh, tracings can be, Pretty accurate, not always. So, uh, I mean, some people kind of drive themselves crazy with it, right? Where they're looking at it all the time. And a lot of, some of them are every day. Episodes, uh, <laughs> especially if uh, you're moving around or nervous while it's happening. But, uh, you know, there's also the Cardia app that, uh, you know, you can hook up to your phone and get a decent EKG. So they're helpful if you get a clear tracing and, you know, some people prefer those. Um, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, sometimes, you know, it all depends on the contact uh, with whichever, you know, uh, tool or, or appliance you're using. If the contact is poor, the tracings tend to be poor as well. But it nevertheless does provide good information sometimes. Yeah, that's the beauty of uh, the specialty electrophysiology and especially palpitations and atrial fibrillation. Because of all these technologies, we're virtually guaranteed to get to the bottom of the symptoms, uh, unlike Dr. Singh said 20 years ago is much more difficult. Here, if you have symptoms, we're guaranteed to get to the bottom of it. And I guess still while we're on the uh, topic of symptoms, Harold was wondering, so uh, if I feel an AFib episode, what do I do? I mean, how concerned should I be? Should I go to the emergency room right away? Like, how do I decide, you know, kind of what to do if I feel something once I know that I actually have AFib? Roger, you can take it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so uh, that's a, a good question. And it's a complicated one because every, like we said, everybody has different manifestations of their atrial fibrillation and it has different implications for each patient. So we have to individualize that type of recommendation. Um, when we approach each patient, we look at each different component of AFib um, to see how important it is to treat quickly. So the first thing, as Dr. Masri said, is the stroke risk. Most people with rest factors will already have, will already treat them with blood thinners. Uh, so that essentially takes away the stroke risk. Uh, the second part is symptoms, uh, how severe the symptoms are and quality of life. And then number three, how dangerous the atrial fibrillation is. It's not necessarily dangerous in all patients, but there are some people where the atrial fibrillation can weaken the heart, can go very fast, can cause severe symptoms. So we have to take all this into account when we make recommendations of uh, what to do when you get AFib. So that's what happens during the consultations with us. We look over your risk factor profile, how it affects you, and then we formulate a plan of action if you have more symptoms, uh, what to do about it. 
Uh, so there are some patients where when they go into AFib, they should contact us immediately. But there are other patients who have more mild symptoms, they're already on blood thinners, um, that it may not be that big a deal to have episodes here and there. Yeah, I think especially if we know that someone's pattern after we get to know them is they their episodes tend to stop on their own. Uh, you know, uh, you may come to the ER and it's going to stop and then you're going to go home, but you just spent 10 hours in the ER before your episode stopped. So uh, once we get, get more experience with, you know, what the AFib tends, to, how the AFib tends to behave, you know, for each particular person, we can give some recommendations there. You know, yeah, our I think... goal is to, to try to prevent you from needing to go to the ER because we all yeah. know how people dislike being in the ER. So uh, that's our goal. Right, I think um, sort of along those lines, um, I'm not sure if there's anybody out there in the audience who has never had AFib and they're trying to figure out what to do if they ever experience a first episode. If it's the first episode where you're feeling palpitations and it's not going away, I think a trip to the emergency room makes sense uh, for two reasons. One, to reassure yourself that everything is okay. Two, to kind of get treatment. And three, to perhaps be able to get a diagnosis quickly. But if you already know that you have atrial fibrillation, I think as a general rule, what I tell patients is if you feel dizzy or, or lightheaded, or if you're having chest pain or you're having shortness of breath, you should go to the emergency room. If you're just feeling the palpitations, but don't have any of the more serious types of symptoms, that could be something that you could wait for and either allow it to go away or try and get help in the morning when it might be more convenient rather than going to the emergency room late at night. Completely agree. I mean, if it's your first episode and we don't know, one, if you don't have a diagnosis, definitely we need an EKG to make that diagnosis. And everyone's AFib is so different. So I think the first episode that you get of palpitations and you don't have a diagnosis, it makes sense to seek immediate medical attention. All right, very good. Uh, so we have a lot of questions about lifestyle. So uh, specifically what lifestyle changes may help with AFib? Uh, uh, can exercise help alleviate future AFib episodes? Uh, uh, Janice wants to know, excuse me, uh, Margaret wants to know, after an ablation, can you have four ounces of white wine with dinner? Not rosé, not red. <laughs> Maybe a sancerre. <laughs> uh, so uh, I guess, uh, you know, there's been a lot of interest in this recently. We touched on that before with sleep apnea, et cetera. So uh, Brown, why don't you take this one? What are the lifestyle things that people can do? Sure. About procedures and medications that may reduce the amount of AFib or allow them to Sure. Um, I think Dr. Singh was, you know, talking about this earlier, uh, obesity, right? So we know that there's a direct correlation between obesity and atrial fibrillation, and it's true of both genders, male and female. So one of the important things is if you are overweight, reducing your weight can help. Along with obesity, a lot of times there exists sleep apnea. Those two conditions can sometimes coexist fairly frequently. And treating sleep apnea has a direct effect on reducing the amount of atrial fibrillation that you're going to have. Uh, and in fact, it can bring it down to levels of controls of patients who actually don't have atrial fibrillation. So those two things are important. Uh, it's helpful to look for reversible causes. If, for example, you have atrial fibrillation and you get blood testing and you find out that your thyroid uh, function is, uh, is sort of hyperactive, then treatment for that is helpful. Now to the more sort of common things that people may be asking about things like uh, alcohol. So we do know that there is a direct correlation between alcohol and atrial fibrillation. In fact, they used to call it holiday heart where patients would drink a lot over the weekend or over a holiday and then following that, they'd end up with atrial fibrillation. So um, we don't quite know if it really does affect everyone, but we know that in some people, alcohol is a trigger and causes atrial fibrillation, even when you drink a small amount. Other people are blessed and are able to drink large amounts with no atrial fibrillation at all. Um, a common thing uh, that I get asked about is coffee or caffeine in general. Um, for a long time, the general rule has been to reduce the amount of caffeine that you uh, take in. But there have been recent studies that are registry type studies that actually are quite large and followed a large number of thousands, tens of thousands of patients. And what they've shown actually is that caffeine does not affect the incidence of atrial fibrillation and that patients who drink three to four cups of caffeine 
actually sometimes have a lower incidence of atrial fibrillation than those who did not drink as much. So I think it's a washout. I think if you want a cup of coffee, you should go ahead and do that. As far as exercise, I would say exercise helps reduce your weight, keeps you in good shape. I think it's a good idea to do overall. Um, if you are in the atrial fibrillation itself though, I would say that when you are exercising, you need to monitor your heart rate because obviously in atrial fibrillation, your heart rate may be elevated and exercise will elevate it even further. So you wanna make sure that it doesn't get to be too high. So, yeah, and there's, the Australian group has really kind of led this area in terms of uh, showing us that, you know, some exercise helps, uh, some weight loss helps. Those are independent factors. Uh, and of course, sleep apnea. So that was something that was not always appreciated. Um, yeah, so uh, building on that, the Australian study um, that came out in 2015 called the Legacy Trial, they actually randomized people divided into groups in which they did these lifestyle modifications, weight loss, and um, they found out that you can reduce your chances of, develop, of, uh, of, of getting a reduction in the amount of atrial fibrillation episode if you lost like 10% or more of your body weight. So it is very dependent on how much weight you lose if you are obese and you have atrial fibrillation and you wanna reduce your chances of having more episodes. So if you lost like two to 3% and then gained it back, then there was no reduction. But if you like lost 10% of your body weight and kept it down, there was actually a reduction which was equivalent to some of the medications that we use to reduce the episodes of AFib. So I think that's a pretty, pretty powerful study and exercise, I think, has a U-shaped curve. I mean, people, uh, athletes who like exercise a lot have a higher incidence of developing atrial fibrillation and people who don't exercise have a higher incidence. So I think uh, the answer is somewhere in the middle. I guess back to the original question of uh, whether or not you can have any alcohol after a fibrillation. You know, that, that's uh, not an easy one because it's gotta be individualized. So it's easy for anybody to say, hey, no alcohol ever. That doesn't really make sense. I mean, the whole point of seeing a doctor and, and getting treatment is so you can be healthy and live a good quality of life. And if you enjoy alcohol, that's part of quality of life. So, but you have to do it in moderation. So after the ablation is done, we'd probably recommend not to have any alcohol in the first month because in the first month or so, the heart's healing from the ablation and we prefer for you to give less irritation to the heart. But after everything's healed, we in generally recommend no more than one or two drinks a day uh, just as a healthy lifestyle choice. Um, but we don't restrict alcohol in general. Uh, that was the whole point of the ablation is so you can live your quality of life. One last thing about uh, lifestyle. If you develop atrial fibrillation, go see your doctor. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so if your lifestyle is to avoid the doctor, <laughs> please go see your doctor because there is excellent data to suggest that if we actually make a diagnosis and intervene earlier on, we can actually help save lives, make you live a longer and healthier lifestyle. If you start having palpitations, go see your doctor. All right, well, uh, kind of segueing on that a little bit, uh, you know, there's these different classifications of AFib. Uh, so uh, there were questions about what is paroxysmal AFib uh, versus persistent AFib. And, uh, you know, what does that mean? What possible implications might there be? Uh, so why don't you go ahead and tackle that one, Abram? You want me to tackle that, Eric? Sure, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I didn't hear who, who you said. Yeah. I'll speak up. Abram, go for it. <laughs> All right. Um, so we tend to categorize atrial fibrillation as either paroxysmal or persistent in general. Uh, what that means is that if you're paroxysmal, atrial fibrillation can come on its own and go away on its own uh, without any kind of intervention from your physician within a span of seven days. If your episode of atrial fibrillation lasts beyond seven days, unless we intervene on it, then we would call that persistent. Not to make things too complicated, but if you've had AFib for over a year, we call that long-standing persistent. Um, if it sounds like I'm going down a list where you're getting from bad to worse, then that is correct. In general, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation 
um, is the early form of atrial fibrillation for most patients. And we prefer to intervene as early as possible in the course of atrial fibrillation. And the reason is that the sources of, or I should say the triggers that cause atrial fibrillation to happen in the heart tend to be somewhat more discrete and localized, and we can target them more effectively. Once atrial fibrillation starts to progress to persistent atrial fibrillation, then it means that there are more areas within the heart that need to be targeted, and our success rates start to decline, and the challenge becomes being able to keep you in normal rhythm for long periods of time. So I would say in general, there is paroxysmal and there's persistent, typically new onset atrial fibrillation is paroxysmal. And that's where you want to get it. That's where you want to get treatment as soon as you realize that you have atrial fibrillation. And even if you do have persistent or long-standing persistent AFib and it needs to be fixed, we still can fix it. It's just, you have to understand it's more effort involved. So effort and maybe, uh, you know, we can speak to how that might, uh, you know, uh, affect success rates. But uh, before we get to that, Roger, why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're actually talking about when we're doing an ablation? Like what is an ablation? How are we actually treating AFib? All right. Yeah. So ablation is the cornerstone of how we treat AFib. And in general, uh, this procedure has got a 70 to 90 percent cure rate for most types of AFib. So the way we do this uh, is under general anesthesia, uh, where you have a breathing tube, so you're totally asleep, uh, you're not gonna feel a thing. And the procedure takes two to four hours on average. So what we do is put IV catheters in both sides of the groin, you know, next to the hips, that's where we enter the veins. And then we weave tiny catheters, the size of a, a pencil up into the heart um, and we find the spots of the heart essentially that cause the AFib and we cauterize it. Um, in general, uh, there are a few reasons why people have AFib. One is there can be abnormal triggering spots in the heart coming from uh, areas called the pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins are the blood vessels that drain the blood from the lungs into the heart. Uh, and there's four of them. And so those are the spots that cause most people's atrial fibrillation. So what we do is we cauterize around those blood vessels to prevent that abnormal electricity from entering the heart. In people with persistent atrial fibrillation, uh, like we we're talking about, their AFib comes from spots outside of these areas in addition to these areas um, because the heart becomes stretched out, scarred, uh, and more spots can circulate to form AFib. And what we do is modify those areas uh, by drawing ablation lines in various spots in the heart to prevent the heart from going into AFib. So, uh, you know, it's a pretty comprehensive procedure. Yeah, and uh, now since, uh, now uh, after this ablation, like Dr. Fan said, uh, once you're done with the procedure, we take the catheters out, uh, you go home the same day uh, and you recover within a week. So it's like, it's become a same day discharge procedure. Uh, uh, I mean, Dr. Fan, Dr. Masri can, Dr. Rajpa can attest to it, but most of our patients, I think 90% of our patients go home uh, the same day. It's like an outpatient same day discharge procedure. So, and that's a big change from when uh, we started doing these things, uh, you know, 20 years ago, it was an all day affair. Uh, so there's definitely been a lot of improvement in the technology. Uh, you know, people were asking about that. So. Uh, I guess uh, another another question that maybe for you, Roger, like what are the changes in the technology, or what should, you know what what do we do specifically? I guess that uh, is an improvement on the procedure that you know may not be offered elsewhere, or what, what are the important components of a, a really good ablation procedure? That's a great question. That this is something we're really proud of. Um, that's why we love this specialty because there's been so much change and improvement uh, and we've seen the progression on a yearly basis. So compared to the way we did this procedure just 10 years ago, it's dramatically better, dramatically improved. Uh, so in terms of time, efficiency, outcome, safety, all aspects of these have been improved. Um, so one of the big uh, improvements is our mode of ventilation uh, during the procedure because if you think about it, when we're ablating uh, the heart, 
we have a tiny catheter the size of a pencil and we're ablating spots in the heart, but the heart's moving and the lungs are moving and it makes stability difficult. So uh, at Sternbrook, we pioneered a technology called jet ventilation. We're actually the only center on Long Island and one of only a handful of centers in the country that have access to this, where it's a special mode of ventilation that makes the lungs very still, incredibly still. So the catheter is very stable when we ablate it in the heart. So that's been proven to shorten procedure times, improve outcomes, uh, which then again, uh, uh, improve safety of the procedure because the shorter the procedure, the safer the procedure. So that's one of the dramatic uh, improvements. And then there's catheter technology. Over the years, the catheters have gotten safer and more effective. Um, and even to things like uh, hemostasis where, you know, when we take the IVs out of the groins, we typically have to stop the bleeding. And the way we used to do that is just put pressure on the groin for half an hour and have the patients lie flat in bed for four to six hours afterwards. That was actually one of the most uncomfortable parts of the procedure is the lying flat afterwards, because you can imagine the back does get sore. So we have new vascular plugs that we just started using in the last couple of years where we don't have to put pressure in the groin anymore. The vein just plugs up uh, within seconds and patients only have to lie flat for two hours. So it's dramatically more comfortable. That's great. So, uh, you know, Roger kind of gave a range of success rates, you know, uh, for ablation. So, Abraham, when you see people in clinic, I mean, how do you kind of counsel them? What do you look for to help, you know, you kind of figure out in your mind, you know, how likely someone is to be a success after an ablation procedure? Sure. Um, I can't stress this enough. Uh, earlier intervention is better. And I think that makes sense. Um, if you think about um, almost anything that we deal with in life, uh, whether it's something medical like blood pressure or diabetes, the earlier, or, or God forbid, cancer, the earlier you intervene, the better the outcomes are. And it's the same for us at home. Uh, if you have something at home that's causing a problem, if you don't address it soon, it becomes a bigger problem. It's the same with atrial fibrillation. Once it starts, it's not going to be a fluke or an accident. It's basically the first sign that you're going to have atrial fibrillation that is going to progress over time. Your best strategy is to allow an electrophysiologist to intervene, get you in normal rhythm, keep you in normal rhythm. And the reason I keep stressing this is because there is excellent data uh, from a trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at earlier interventions. And what they've showed is that if you intervene within the first six days to six months of the first diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, you can get patients to actually live longer. And that's a startling outcome because in medicine, we can look at different outcomes, but things like whether you live longer or not is not something that's up for debate. We call that a hard endpoint. So when patients live longer, that really makes us pay attention. And so I would say when a patient comes to my office and they have atrial fibrillation, I urge them to get back in order with them or to allow me to intervene on them in one way or another as quickly as possible. In terms of how, it can either be with medication or ablation. But my personal preference is an ablation strategy. And my reasons for that are simply that the ablation strategy has a higher success rate than the uh, medication strategy. In general, medications uh, have a success rate of somewhere between 30 to 40%. In case you're wondering what that means, if you take the medicine for a year, the likelihood that you will be in normal rhythm for that year is about 30 to 40%. So the flip side is you're likely to have a recurrence about 60% of the time. With an ablation, it's still not 100%, but it's much higher. It's 70%, maybe even 80% with a first time procedure. And in my view, that's far better because you're using a catheter to get rid of the problem and not having to give medication to the patient every single day of their life. And in terms of the complication rates, People may think that a procedure is more likely to have a complication and I'd rather just take a pill. Well, the reality is that that is not true. We have a large trial that looked at outcomes between patients who received medications and those who got an ablation as first line treatment for atrial fibrillation. We call that the Cabana trial. And in that trial, they showed that the complication rate was really no different. And that's something that patients quite, don't quite understand 
When you take a medicine, you need to understand that it can be associated with side effects and complications. And so it's not a free lunch. So in my view, the ablation has a higher success rate and has the same complication rate as taking a pill. And so I feel that that's a better strategy at trying to control atrial fibrillation. And it's been shown to actually make patients live longer if they actually go on to receive the ablation instead of just kind of talking about it and never actually getting it. So I say that the success rate is about 70 to 80% for a first time procedure. If the patient has recurrence and that can happen, a second procedure boosts that up by another 10 or 15%. If you've allowed the atrial fibrillation to become persistent, meaning you haven't sought care for a long time, or you allowed the atrial fibrillation to fester, that success rate comes down significantly. It drops by about 20%. And so again, earlier intervention is better. Um, and as far as other factors, I still tell patients that they should lose weight, they should watch their blood pressure, and they should try and exercise. And all those improve outcomes as well. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, uh, the success rate, I guess, there are different, different definitions for different people. Like you said, I mean, if you count success as the absence of any episode of atrial fibrillation lasting more than 30 seconds, then yes, your success rate, when you count it, is going to be like 60, 70, 80% in that range. But if you count success as the reduction in the amount of atrial fibrillation that you're having, called the burden of atrial fibrillation, there are trials that have shown like a 99% reduction in the amount of atrial fibrillation that you're having. So if now you have episodes once a month, once in a couple of weeks, you get an ablation done, and now you have episodes once in three years, do you count that as a success? You count that as a failure? Uh, it's subjective, but uh, we do know that the ablation reduces the amount of atrial fibrillation that you get. And, you know, the harder you look, you may find short episodes, but you definitely are reducing the total amount. I mean, other things we look at, you, you know, in terms of figuring out what, how likely someone is to respond, you know, are sizes of the heart chambers, you know, how much valve disease, particularly mitral valve, if they have a leaky mitral valve, that might have some impact, you know, if it's uncorrected and severely leaky. So these are all things we look at to kind of come up with a strategy. Um, so uh, there are some questions about heart failure in AFib. Uh, so uh, Abhijit says heart failure contribute to AFib, vice versa. How do we go about managing these two things that we see a lot of? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great question. It's like a chicken and the egg. I mean, what comes first and what follows? Uh, it's hard to know. Uh, initially, when we have a patient who comes in with heart failure and also has atrial fibrillation, you don't know it was if they develop a heart failure because of some other reason and atrial fibrillation is a byproduct of it, or if they developed atrial fibrillation, didn't realize, and after a few weeks, uh, their heart started getting weak. Like Dr. Masri said, the heart's getting weaker, the muscle gets weaker, and then they come into heart failure. So what we usually do is if someone comes in with heart failure and atrial fibrillation, once we make sure that they don't have blockages in the blood vessels of the heart, which is the most common cause for developing a weak heart, uh, then we get their heart back into normal rhythm. And then uh, also put them on a medication, like a strong medication to try to keep their heart in normal rhythm and then repeat uh, the ultrasound of a heart to see if the heart is getting better. Uh, based on, on, on that concept, uh, there was a trial that came out that actually showed uh, improvement uh, in mortality, so less people dying uh, in this kind of a situation with heart failure and AFib if they underwent an ablation procedure uh, as compared to just using medications. Because like Dr. Masri said, medications have their own side effects. And I think they get exacerbated when someone's in heart failure and the blood's not flowing right. So, and they develop kidney disease. So um, if there is heart failure, if there's atrial fibrillation, I think there is uh, good data that uh, uh, going towards an ablation reduces mortality, that helps people uh, live longer. So one question uh, some people may have is uh, the data seems pretty clear. And from what we're saying that in general, if you compare medicines versus ablation for AFib, the, the ablation is better. And I, I totally agree with that. But some patients may say, why are you even considering medicines if the ablation is better? Um, and the simple answer is some patients, 
uh, the timing is not right for an ablation because they have other medical conditions that would make a procedure risky. So we use the medicines to, to calm the heart uh, and bridge them to more definitive therapy. But there are other patients who are healthier and they don't have that much AFib and they just don't want to undergo a procedure for a small burden of AFib. That makes sense. And in those patients, we use medicines to calm it, to bridge. At some point, the medicines will fail because, you know, as, as you've heard, as time goes on, the burden of AFib will slowly grow, grow higher and higher, and the medicines will be overpowered. At that point, you could decide on whether or not you want an ablation or that's the right timing for you. So there is a role for medicines. I'd also say that in patients who have other conditions that have heart failure um, to begin with, the occurrence of atrial fibrillation on top of their heart failure can worsen a stable condition and make it unstable. And in those patients, um, you know, sort of an earlier intervention is going to be better for those patients, not just in terms of how long they live, but also the quality of life, because that's important. When patients are in heart failure and having trouble breathing, or if they're having symptoms like they're feeling tired, they're not able to do the activities that they normally do, that's a significant impact on their quality of life. And ultimately, that's what we're all looking for. We're all looking for a better quality of life. And being in normal rhythm, whether it's on a medication or with an ablation, plays a big role in that. All right, so while we're on the topic of medication, lots of questions about blood thinners, uh, side effects of blood thinners. Uh, uh, if I have an ablation, can I stop Eliquis afterwards? Uh, and uh, I had one episode of AFib, I'm on Eliquis. Do I, I've had nothing since that I'm aware of. Do I still have to stop? Do I still need to take it? Uh, so, uh, and what are alternatives? So uh, I guess, uh, uh, Abhijit, do you want to, uh, that one. Yeah, so I think those are important questions. I mean, uh, we, as of now, the thinking is that if you have even one episode of atrial fibrillation, uh, your risk of stroke uh, is comparable to someone who's in atrial fibrillation a lot of the time. And we use a risk score called CHADS VASC score, in which, like Dr. Masri was saying, it includes your age being above 65, especially 75 years, diabetes, history of stroke, history of heart failure. Um, so these are all risk factors that we use to determine what your risk uh, of a stroke is. And then uh, that's not the only risk score we use. We also use another risk score to determine what your risk of bleeding is on these blood thinners. And then once, if we think that your risk of stroke is higher than the risk of bleeding, then we recommend blood thinners. Now, the question about stopping blood thinners after ablation, um, we usually recommend against it. And the reason is, like we said, uh, none of us here said that the success rate of an ablation is 100%. And no one, else, and no one will. It's not in anywhere in the world. Um, atrial fibrillation can come back. And even if you say the success rate is 90%, so if it comes back 10% of the time, then there is a risk of you having a stroke. So, uh, uh, so we don't, uh, stroke is irreversible. Uh, risk, the strokes that we get with atrial fibrillation are much severer than other causes. So we really uh, prefer that the patients continue blood thinners even after an ablation. Um, and uh, the other thing is uh, like someone said that they don't uh, know if they've had any other episodes of atrial fibrillation. I think monitoring is a big part of it. Because sometimes also after an ablation procedure, patients don't feel their episodes of atrial fibrillation as much. So we have to be careful before we declare someone, before we declare victory that you're done with AFib, that we monitor them for a prolonged period of time. And even then, my personal recommendation is to not stop blood thinners if their risk, score of, if their risk of stroke is high. Yeah, also, um... I think it's important to recognize that blood thinners uh, are essentially that. They thin your blood, and therefore the biggest complication that you might see is bleeding. Uh, there are some rare uh, reactions to blood thinners um, that are fairly uncommon, and uh, every drug is going to have some kind of idiosyncratic uh, reaction possibly with a patient. But for the most part, the biggest thing that we are concerned about on a blood thinner is the risk of bleeding. And I get that question a lot where patients are concerned that they're bleeding, 
Uh, they uh, basically cut themselves while they're shaving and it takes a long time to stop. Uh, they have bruises uh, on their skin. And while I understand that this is all somewhat inconvenient, uh, I would say to them that the risk of developing a stroke is there. And the consequences of having a stroke far outweigh those types of, um, of complaints that they may have of being on a blood thinner. In other words, if someone has a stroke, that's really gonna suck. Um, patients can become debilitated. Uh, patients can die from strokes. And obviously there is a significant loss in quality of life when you have a stroke. Um, in terms of uh, bleeding uh, risk, um, I would say that bleeding is far more manageable than stroke. Uh, for the most part, patients can come to the emergency room if they have significant bleeding that requires that. Uh, they can receive blood transfusion. Their blood thinners can be held uh, and can even be reversed now that we have antidotes for those medications. But a stroke is a far different story. If you don't get help immediately within the 90 minutes to three hours, that window where, patient, where your physician can intervene on a stroke may expire. And then you're left with a debilitating consequence. And so I always tell patients when you're thinking about taking a blood thinner and some of the things that come along with taking a blood thinner, I would say that the alternative is far worse. So you have to keep that in perspective. I totally agree with that. One of the things that we see uh pretty commonly is an unfounded fear of blood thinners uh, because you see a lot of commercials on TV with lawyers saying, IV bleed, call us. And I think that adds to the fear, but the, the true numbers are there's a one to 2% risk of major bleeding every year on these blood thinners. But when the major studies were done that they compared aspirin with these blood thinners, there was not much different in risk between aspirin and the blood thinners. So People take aspirin every day without thinking twice about it. The risk of taking a blood thinner instead, like Eliquis, Zeralto, Pradaxa, Coumadin, is not much different than that. And, you know, like Dr. Machi is saying, if you do have major bleeding, there are reversal agents that reverse it within two minutes. So, you know, part of our job is to allay the unfounded fear of these blood thinners. Uh, but you know, in the rare patients that actually do have major bleeding or cannot be on blood thinners, we do have solutions for that too. You know, uh, Dr. Uh, Rashba is an expert in implanting the Watchman procedure. Uh, it's a device that can go into the left atrium of the heart from the appendage and plug up that area of the heart. And after it heals, um, they, the patient may stop the blood thinner. This is not meant for everybody. It's really just meant for people who cannot be on blood thinners or cannot tolerate. Yeah, and so the things that we think about there in terms of people who have really serious problems with blood thinners, you know, uh, recurrent bleeding of any kind, right? So, uh, so GI bleeding where you need transfusion, you know, there's actually a classification in all the anticoagulation trials of major bleeding. And so, you know, uh, your hemoglobin going down by a certain amount, needing a transfusion, having to be hospitalized, et cetera. Uh, the common things we see are GI bleeding, uh, some people, you know, intracranial bleeding, bleeding inside the brain. Uh, prone to falls also is a big thing. Uh, so if people are falling and they may bang their head, that's, you know, uh, a situation where we consider, uh, uh, you know, uh, the watchman procedure, so a, or a device to close the left atrial appendage. We talked about that before. It's a little sac that hangs off uh, the left atrium, and ninety percent of the clots form there. So if we're able to seal that area with the watchman device, which is possible ninety-five percent of the time with newer devices, uh, typically forty-five days afterwards, we can uh, de-escalate blood thinners to aspirin and Plavix, uh, and six months later, just aspirin. So the advantages in those, in those situations that people still have stroke protection equivalent to a blood thinner, uh, but the bleeding risk is far lower. But most people uh, who do not have those kinds of more severe conditions, you know, at this time uh, should just be on a blood thinner. Uh, the newer medications, you know, also are much easier to take, don't require the same monitoring and also have less risk of hemorrhage, particularly in the brain. So. Um, as you guys said, uh, that's an important thing that we try to emphasize that, uh, you know, the role of the blood thinners in preventing stroke. 
uh, while we're on the topic of strokes, so, uh, you know, when people have a stroke and we don't know why, like, what should the approach be there? We know AFib is a common cause of stroke. Uh, you know, should we be looking for atrial fib in someone who's had a stroke that there's no real cause found? Uh, Abhijit, you want to take that one? Uh, yes, uh, I think that is uh, that's an extremely important question and something that we uh, that we run into every day. Uh, patients come in with stroke, and the neurologists uh, do, cannot come up with a reason as to why they have a stroke. They don't find uh, like a clot somewhere in the legs or a hole in the heart through which the, the blood clot went through the legs into the brain, or they don't have like a blockage in one of the uh, blood vessels in the neck. So if they tell us that, uh, that they don't know why this person had a stroke, then uh, the options uh, are uh, we either start with an external monitor for 30 days that I was talking about with lifetime monitoring to detect atrial fibrillation or implanting a small chip under the skin called an implantable loop recorder. Uh, now they've, they've done head-to-head -head trials between the outside monitoring in people who come in with a stroke without a reason uh, versus people who have a chip. And there's a far higher detection of atrial fibrillation in people who underwent a chip implant because most of the AFib was detected after 30 days of a stroke. So patients who uh, come in with a stroke, I think it's extremely important uh, to look for atrial fibrillation because like we were saying, there's something called paroxysmal atrial fibrillation in which patients go in and out of. So when you're in the hospital, when you go to your doctor's office, there is no AFib. But at home, when you're sleeping at night, you have episodes of AFib that you don't realize. So I think monitoring for atrial fibrillation is important because if we find atrial fibrillation, we'll put you on blood thinners so that you don't have another more devastating stroke. So I think uh, an implantable chip called implantable loop recorder, I think is state of the art at this point and has a battery life of up to four and a half years. And in general, when patients do come in with strokes that they can't, we can't find the source of initially and we put in the microchips, uh, the data shows that one out of three patients with that chip will have an eventual diagnosis of AFib. So uh, we have a question from Arlene, wanted to know, uh, you know, in terms of age, do we treat people who are uh, 80 or older different with AFib as opposed to other patients? Uh, why don't you go ahead and take that, Roger? Yeah, that's a really good question. And again, uh, the theme of what I've been saying a lot, you know, our therapy is pretty individualized, uh, but talking in generalities, the younger the patient, the more aggressive we are in trying to treat the AFib and keep the patient in normal rhythm uh, with either medicines or, you know, as you've been hearing, uh, ablation at some point. When the patient starts getting older, then we get into a risk benefit ratio of whether or not uh, it's in the patient's wishes or, you know, interest to do a procedure to fix the AFib. And the patients who are older, we do do the ablation to fix the AFib, um, in general have risk factors like heart failure, their heart being weak, or the heart rates are out of control and we can't control the heart rate with the medicines. Um, so something that significantly impacts uh, the life uh, or quality of life of the patient. If you're an older patient and you have AFib, the heart's under good control, you have very minimal or no symptoms and the heart function is nice and strong on, on echocardiograms, yeah, you, you definitely do have the option of uh, just treating with medicines and letting it go. Uh, but again, it's a very individualized uh, uh, decision process. Uh, just briefly, we had a question from Kathy in terms of growing complications of ablation. Uh, so uh, someone had an experience with pseudoaneurysm, so damage to the arteries. And uh, uh, when we were talking about advancements in the procedure, one thing we didn't mention is using ultrasound in order to place uh, our IVs. We've seen a dramatic reduction in complications to the groin with uh, using ultrasound. We can actually visually see instead of just feeling the artery and trying to go next to it. So uh, that's something we use routinely now uh, for all of our ablation procedures. Um, so now we come to the best part, uh, the last question for the panel. Um, so what do you do to take care of your own heart health? Dr. Alvasri, we're all ears. <laughs> uh, <laughs> mine is a very tough regimen. <laughs> um, so 
I think uh, exercise in general is a good way to do it. Um, and, oh, um, you know, I, I have a stationary bike uh, that I use at home. Uh, I think that that's a good way to do it. Uh, and uh, just kind of trying to eat right uh, and to try and get some rest uh, whenever that's possible. I think those are good things. All right. Abhiji. Uh Water. Uh, I don't go in for, uh, for, for energy drinks or um, try to stay away from alcohol. Oh, and, no. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, is that a coke or a coke and rum cannot be disclosed <laughs> all right and roger apart from your uh diet soda presumably well we'll call it soda not necessarily <laughs> diet but uh it's my guilty pleasure today <laughs> So in general, um, you know, the theme is keeping the weight down. That's one of the most important things. Um, so, you know, I do 40 minutes of cardiovascular exercise four days a week, you know, as recommended by the American Heart Association. Um, also a low salt diet makes sense because it's all an indirect, um, you know, benefit because the low salt diet leads to less high blood pressure and lower blood pressure leads to less strain on the heart and less AFib. So, you know, losing some weight, uh, low salt diet and uh, plenty of cardiovascular exercise makes a lot of sense. I would agree. I pretty much do the same thing. Try to get exercise, uh, yoga, cardio. Um, I'm also mostly vegan these days and uh, uh, that helped me lose a fair amount of weight without even trying. So that, that was, helpful for me. Uh, but uh, you don't need to go full bore. And, you know, you hear this all the time, I would say, uh, you know, people go on a diet. And uh, if you're going on a diet, you know, it's not going to last, right? You have to make right. small, small changes in your, uh, you know, eating habits, you know, uh, uh, transitioning maybe more to plant based a little bit at a time, and you're more likely to stick with it. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that's very important. All right, so uh, thank you very much to our panelists uh, and to each of you for joining us this evening. Uh, we hope to you, that you use this month to continue to educate yourself and your loved ones on heart health so you can keep your heart in rhythm, enjoy your quality of life, as everyone said tonight. And at Stony Brook Heart Institute, if you're looking to prevent heart disease or have an existing heart condition, our entire team is here ready to help. Thanks for attending tonight. Thank you. Thank you All for right. having us. Bye-bye.